Hi, I'm David Berlin, Editor-in-Chief with Programmable Web, and this is part three of our 11-part series on APIs 101. If you missed the other two parts, go back and watch them because we establish a lot of prerequisites to understand this part, so it's very important that you see all of that. Now, broadly speaking, here's what we've been talking about for this whole entire series. What exactly is an API? How do they work? Why you should invest in APIs, whether you're a developer or an API provider? how to productize APIs. In other words, how to think about them as products, how to secure them because we take APIs and we put them on a network and network security and internet security are of a paramount concern. What is API first design in terms of a, meth a methodology and why is it so important that you follow that methodology when you're building your APIs? And lastly, we're gonna put our hands on and we're gonna build some APIs and consume them in a way that you get a really good idea of how they work. Now, in this series, we've already talked about how APIs are a different kind of user interface. They're just for machines as opposed to the user interface that you and I are used to using when we work with computers, whether that be a smartphone, a desktop, desktop computer, a web computer, it doesn't matter. And we also talked about some somewhat imperfect analogies in the real world that are good analogies for how APIs work and the contract that exists between the consumer of an API and the provider of an API. We talked about the wall socket, we talked about Lego and intermodal shipping containers. Now, in this video, we're going to talk about how these contracts, these APIs, provide organizations with an amazing amount of flexibility, again, looking back on the analogies that we just looked at. And in specific, we're going to focus on the electrical wall socket analogy because it really gets the point across. So let's look at how the contract of the 120 volts of alternating current, the arrangement of the prongs, the short, the tall, the ovular one, the, the way the whole thing is arranged in a way that both the provider and the consumer don't know a whole lot about each other, provides organizations with an amazing amount of flexibility when you think about it in terms of APIs. So here we are, that's the contract in the middle, the 120 volts of alternating current. On the top, you have your consumers. You have a hairdryer, you have a computer, you have a Tesla, you have a toaster. They all conform to the contract when they're consuming electricity. They know exactly what it is they need from the wall socket in order to do what it is they do. Now, on the other side of the wall socket is the provider of the service. This is the electric utility, and here's where the flexibility comes in. That electricity can be delivered from a coal burning plant, from a nuclear plant, from wind, from hydroelectric, it doesn't matter. So long as it's delivering power to the wall socket in a way that conforms to the contract, the consumers don't know and don't care. We call this decoupling. We're separating the concerns of the consumers and the providers in a way that they don't have to know a whole lot about each other. They just have to conform to the contract in the middle. And that's very important when you think about flexibility because if you're the electric utility and you're looking for ways to drive down costs or do more for the environment, now you have some options that you can put in place while not disrupting your consumers who are using that electricity. Now, in the Lego world, we have a very specific contract that exists between the providers and the consumers, the one that attaches to the other one, and this makes it possible for you to attach anything to anything. Just like you can connect any device to any source of electric power, this contract, the height of the stub on the Lego piece, is what defines how these pieces connect to each other in a way that any piece can, can pretty much connect to any piece. Intermodal shipping containers, we talked about that earlier. Any container can connect to any form of transportation. A tractor trailer truck, a rail car, a boat, it doesn't matter. They all conform to the twist lock contract that we described in the last video series. And in the API world, what this means is that any system, whether it's your smartphone, a server, a desktop computer, it doesn't matter, can connect to any system and you can change things underneath. So if you have all of these client consumer systems on top going through the cloud, through a network, connecting to something underneath, that something underneath can be anything you want it to be so long as it conforms to the contract. Now let's talk about those consumers for one second. You have web apps, the kind that run on your phone or your desktop in a web browser. You have desktop applications, ones that are designed to run on a specific operating system like Mac OS X 
or Windows. You have server applications that run on the server side, on Windows Server or maybe run on a Linux server. And you have mobile applications. These are the ones that run in your smartphones and we all know and use those every single day. And then finally we have devices. These are those little devices that you sometimes hear about are a part of the Internet of Things. All of these can be consumers of APIs and in some cases even providers of APIs. Now let's talk about the flexibility of those that those consumers have when it comes to interacting with something on the other side of an API. If there's a contract in the middle and you have all these different types of, types of consumers, just like the hair dryer and the Tesla and the computer, right? Underneath, you can power that entire API with whatever you want to power it with, so long as it conforms to the contract of the API. You can power it with Windows.net. You can power it with Linux. You can power it with an IBM mainframe. It doesn't matter. As long as the API remains unchanged, just the way the wall sockets, electricity remains unchanged, then the consumers don't know or care. Why is this flexibility important? Well, imagine that you're running an IBM mainframe and it costs you millions of dollars a year to run that mainframe. Well, maybe you want to drive the cost out of your infrastructure. That mainframe is delivering an API to all of your consumers, to your, your server application, your web application, your desktop, your Android app, and you want to take the cost down. Well, rebuild that application on your Linux server and then provide the same API, conform to the contract. The consumers won't know or care what's providing the underlying service and suddenly you just wiped out a whole bunch of cost. That is the kind of flexibility that organizations are looking for today and that's how APIs deliver you that flexibility. So that's the end of this third part of our series, our 11 part video series on APIs 101. In the next part, we're going to talk a little bit more about how that flexibility brings you the idea of digital transform transformation and the ability to rip apart a huge monolithic infrastructure that looks like a hairball, something like this patchwork quilt, and turn it into something that is much more efficient. Thanks very much and we'll see you in the fourth part of this series.